while back, I read 20th Century Boys by Naoki Urasawa and reviewed it on my blog. Link will be in the notes below because I'm going to reference that. Um, at the time, I kind of drew some connections between Urasawa's work and Stephen King's earlier novel, It. Both were works that shift narrative between the characters in childhood and the present day, and even later in the case of 20th Century Boys. Um, both have heavy themes about childhood friendship and connections past and present and needing to remember elements of things that happened in the past in order to resolve a present mystery or threat. However, having finished reading now It, the Stephen King novel, which I'm now reading, reviewing today, I have come to find some differences between the two and their main themes and how they're executed, and I fear I want to get into that now. Quick note here, I'm talking about It. I haven't watched the movies. I haven't watched the TV miniseries adaptation, at least not in its entirety, so I'm not going to be making any comparisons between the novel and the adaptations. Also, the book is really damn long. It's one of King's most notable bullet stoppers, so I'm not going to be doing a heavy recap here. So, heads up on that. It, as a book, balances back and forth between two timelines, following a group of friends from the fictional town of Derry, Maine, through their childhoods in the 1950s and the then-present of 1985. This group, Ben, Bill, Beverly, Stan, Mike, Eddie, and Richie, dubs themselves the Loser Club, or I'm just going to call them the Losers for short, because they, honestly, they probably read the comic book at the time, these, knowing these characters, as far as the DC comic, yeah. Uh, the characters are bound together through their investigation in the past of a eldritch abomination that is responsible for murdering a bunch of children from the town, both in the past and in their presence, both presence. And they also all have a personal reason for bringing this thing down, from being threatened by it in various forms, to, in the case of Bill, having lost his brother to this entity. However, this entity in the work is given no name other than simply just it. It is able to take a variety of forms, often selecting forms based on its victim's greatest fear when it's preying on them, and then when it wants to pass among society or try to entice people in, the form of Pennywise the Dancing Clown. Um, sort of like a mask of Nyarlath Hotep, but even then, the, the characters in the work, while the entity would identify itself as Pennywise from time to time, the characters in the work will generally still stick with referring to it as It. So, I mentioned the difference between the main themes of 20th Century Boys and It at the start of the work. Both series, as mentioned, shift themselves through parallel or semi-parallel narratives involving the protagonist as kids and as adults, with the protagonist needing to remember or discover events from their childhoods, or rediscover, um, in order to inform what they need to do in the present to deal with the threat that they're facing in the present day. Both have antagonistic forces um, with ambiguous names, It in this novel and The Friend in 20th Century Boys. But the difference is, is 20th Century Boys is a work about the dangers of nostalgia, with The Friend putting together an apocalyptic plan based on a book of prophecy that the kids had put together that was in turn, when they were children, informed by the pop culture they were, they were consuming as kids of the 1970s in Japan. James Bond, Ultraman, Giant Robo, that sort of thing. Um... The antagonist in that work is all about Enka instead of rock and roll, because as kids, they hate Enka and they love rock and roll. It's a threat fueled by nostalgia and a desire to recapture the past. It's a good and certainly very relevant theme, and one which I will definitely expand on later and probably should do another video or essay about. But it's a very different theme from the theme, from the theme of It. It on the other hand, goes in a different direction. Or rather, I should say 20th Century Boys, boys went a different direction from It. But Its theme is one which is also very much worth talking about and still relevant today. The idea of our society, the life we feel comfortable in and which calls to us and we, em and we embrace. Well, having been built on an undercurrent of violence and hate, which we have to come to terms with to confront and to grapple, and otherwise grapple with, and hopefully overcome. This comes up in the story through the present-day sequences, through the narrative of Mike Hanlon. Mike isn't the leader of this group of friends, but he is the one who has appointed himself to stay in Derry after their initial confrontation with It, to keep a watch out for It, and to learn more about It. 
Man, this damn thing's name is a pain in the ass to write a script around. Considering how King has talked in the past about his affinity for audiobooks, I do wish they'd written this book with some consideration for the spoken word and given it something that stood out a little more. At least with the friends in 20th Century Boys, that name was a little distinctive while still having a sinister implication as opposed to just it or the thing in the John Carpenter film. Anyway, over the course of Mike's research, he, and thus we the reader, learn more about the background of Derry and about the boatloads of various horrific acts that have happened in the town's past. Axe murder is a factory explosion that killed a bunch of children, most of the children in the town, the ambush killing of some gangsters, and in particular, the torching of an off-base officer's club that Mike's dad ran in World War II, an off-base officer's club that he had to run, although there was off-base, but had to be off-base, because Mike's dad is black. Mike Hanlon and Stan Uris of the Losers are somewhat distinct within the town, because while all of the members of the Outsiders are outcasts and outsiders, all socially ostracized to one degree or another, Mike and Stan are further outcasts. Um, Mike for being black and Stan for being Jewish. And even then, Stan has a sort of degree of passing privilege. Everyone in town knows that his family is Jewish and can push back again and push back against them and look askance at them because of this. But if you didn't already have the, the collective knowledge of the community going in, you wouldn't know that. Mike's family, because they're black, they're like the only black commun uh, family in the town. You're, you, you, they stick out. They stand out. They, they can't hide that. And even in the, in the present day portion of the story, with, um, a certain degree of increased diversity in the town and other extents. Um, Mike is still part of very much a minority with of a minority within the community, um, or just still a minority. Literally, the uh, dairy is described as being very predominantly vanilla, and the town itself, while it has grown and changed economically and over time become more built up, it is still considered to be and described as being very much in every town. And so you can go, you can drive right through it with a certain degree of privilege, with the certain degree of privilege that the other members of the community, that the other members of the losers have, and it would seem normal, ordinary, whereas Mike have being aware, well, obviously, of the discrimination and prejudice that he f faces in society due to his ethnicity, is also aware of what lingers beneath the surface and has to be aware of the prejudices and of hate that can linger within the community and simmer beneath the surface in a way that all the rest of the losers are not necessarily able to see. Consequently, Mike is in a position to chart the rot that lies beneath the dairy to an extent that even the community itself and their, uh, and certainly the other members of the losers, save maybe Stan, would have been blind to. Of course, the catch is that the rot within dairy, it's not manufactured by it, but it is strengthened and reinforced by it. Reading the book now with what we in the United States and other parts of the world have been going through, over the past few years, reading, finishing it now in 2020, it's clear that the roots of what's wrong through through dairy manifest through various degrees of societal rot and under undercurrents of hate that we are still grappling with: bigotry of all stripes, homophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, misogyny, and ableism. All five of these are represented over the course of the plot to various degrees. Mike, the racism that Mike faces as a black person, um, the anti-Semitism Stan faces being Jewish, Beverly facing misogyny and abuse from her father, gendered abuse 
from her father and then her husband in the present day, Bill Stutter. And then with the insurgent, then the, the act that marks the return of it in the present day being a hate crime against a gay couple. That said, what makes this a horror story instead of a suspense thriller is the fact that all this, which probably would have still been there to a certain extent to begin with, is heightened by a eldritch abomination from beyond the stars that came to Der where Derry is before mankind walked on North America. This also leads to where the book kind of stumbles, not with the supernatural elements of the story, but with attempts to explain it. King just kind of goes one step too far in trying to explain how this particular supernatural confrontation works, and it kind of trips over itself. This is a shame because, well, well before I had ever picked up this book or tried to watch any adaptation of it, I had become a fan of anime and manga. And by the time I'd encountered any of the adaptations and picked up this book, I had watched a considerable amount of it, particularly of the 90s and 80s variety, because, well, that's when I got started. And so I'd become a fan of that particular stripe with your own Miyoji and psychics fighting demons and other monsters. And that leads into the, the climax of the work. Actually, in a lot of respects, I think about it. Um, even to a degree, the very ill-conceived sewer group sex scene. Like, the final climax of the story, which has the losers finally confronting it in its lair, um, was very reminiscent of earlier works, like from everything from Doom to Megalopolis to uh, not earlier works, not earlier works, but other works of anime that I had in, encountered before this, I should say. Um, things from like, like Doom Megalopolis to Akira and uh, Armageddon slash Genma War, Genma Tyson. With, whereas before this, actually, Doom Megalopolis is actually a pretty good compar comparison because Doom Megalopolis has a, like, building before the big cataclysmic confrontations has other moodier, creepier threats which appear in smaller forms which the our protagonists aren't necessarily able to directly confront or, or they do directly confront but which they're not necessarily fully equipped to handle yet before we finally get to the big cataclysmic confrontation at the end of the work, and that's the case here. I mean, literally, the end of the story, without getting too much into spoilers, has the remaining losers, not all of them make it, I'm not going to say who, actually, one of them dies fairly early on and they kills themselves rather than confronting it directly. Um, facing... Um, after facing these various and very intense, very creepy supernatural threats created by it or people that it has managed to control, um, which are creepy and intense and gross out fun suspense thriller moments, um, not suspense thriller, but like fun supernatural horror moments, this leads to a basically confrontation between our protagonists against it on the astral plane while surrounding all of this um in the future timeline Derry is getting torn apart buildings collapsing and other massive levels of psych of um, property damage as this like supernatural psychically fueled um uh, or magically fueled a whole, um storm horrific storm is just rampaging through the town um all while there's this supernatural astral confrontation is happening in the town um below the city well, like it feels like very much reminiscent of these these other big flashy fights in anime and manga um not with like throwing energy blast or that sort of thing but we have two characters like like just staring at each other and calling forth these magical aura these, mag these magical or psychic auras is just things get ripped apart around them um spectacularly uh like the only way this could be more of an 80s anime in this respect with the conclusion and i say this with all reverence and respect and what what caused me to just keep flipping through the book as it ends uh as the last part just kept me like riveted to my chair would have been for it to have been impaled on tokyo tower or an equivalent thereof 
that said, it does create a certain degree of emotional whiplash where like the earlier works are like earlier portions of the book are slower, more moody and atmospheric. And then like this tense in like weaving its way, weaving the narrative through these, th these threats. Then we get to this last point and it's like Stephen King says, oh, we're on a straightaway now. I got this nitrous right here. How about we let her rip? And he does. And it's amazing. Do I wish I read this book sooner? Actually, yes. Absolutely. Um, like, high school age me, like, who was drawn into anime by freaking, well, Demon City Shinjuku which I believe I've also previously reviewed, uh, would have been all over it. And I'm, as someone who still maintains a reverence for that particular stripe of anime, I'm, I'm still into it now. That said, as I mentioned earlier, it does have the issue with lots of other mid-80s anime where you need to go into it with a content warning in mind for as those works, there's sexual abuse and sexual assault discussed and in some cases like almost happens on page it doesn't actually happen but it comes really close and that could cause problems for people and again there's a awkward final act group sex scene in the sewers involving minors and i have no idea what the hell king was thinking of with that as with him being an anglo American writer in the 80s, as opposed to a mangaka where there is other things going on there. So yeah, there's that. Um, as of this recording, and probably on, for on, so consider about time going forward, the book is available, among a lot of other places, through Amazon.com, both in print, audiobook, and physical, and uh, Kindle editions, and all of those links to those will be in the notes below um those will be referral links buying anything through those links will help support the show Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.